This program is powered by the virtual.show, making your offline events virtual. Ladies and gentlemen, the host of Web at Virtual, Dr. Plamen Rusev. Hello and welcome to wonderful web communities from all around the world. We have over 100 countries uh, registered for this particular event. I will know the numbers of all of you joining us in a second, but it's such a pleasure to have you all with us. Thank you. Uh, we start with over 4,000 people on the live channel and the beginning of the discussion on corporate responsibility week. We are having some great attendees from um, all around the world during this week discussing the corporate responsibility, the role of the business in overcoming this challenging times. And I am a confirmed believer that one thing is for sure, it is all about us. It's about the people and about strong communities to overcome every challenge that we have because that's the magic of the humankind. We are all together. Being together makes us who we are. And we better prove that particular position in the pyramid of um, of this beautiful planet Earth and make sure we continue ahead. We see the COVID crisis becoming a catalyst of so many challenging developments. We see big shift in the way people perceive going to work. From the very beginning, it was, oh, we have to work from home. Now it's like, oh, do we have to go back to the offices? From the very beginning, it was, oh my gosh, it's a social distancing thing, you cannot work. Uh, now in, uh, in Latvia and uh, Estonia and the Nordics, they say, should we stop being two meters away and keep our usual five meters distance between people and talking? All this is, is challenging and we see that it is going to be such. But as we say in our beautiful community, is the challenging time when the leadership is the most needed and the leaders are those that are born So in such time. So let's have our leadership, thought leadership summit starting now. Allow me to introduce my first fascinating guest. Mariam Alfadiri heads global marketing and corporate social responsibility at Agility, one of the world's leading logistics companies. She's been named one of Asia's top sustainability superwomen in 2019. At Agility, Mariam is responsible for driving digital marketing, corporate communications and the company's award-winning sustainability strategy that has reached more than 1.6 million people in need. Marianne, it's such a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you for joining. Thank you for having me. It is uh, your bio that speaks for yourself. We have heard uh, it over the video before you entered the studio, and I would say that we are truly honored to have you with us. And I very much look forward to extract as much as possible. Um, of your knowledge, know-how, experience, and vision. And wow, being uh, the superwoman, uh, top sustainability superwoman is, uh, is something. Uh, and uh, again, thank you for joining. My first question for you would be, uh, we have seen that the supply chain was dramatically disrupted. And uh, of course, this, was, uh, this led us to so many different um, small, medium, large crises everywhere in the world. Um, it's a first. It's a it's a chain uh, supply uh, crisis. It's a health crisis. It's economic crisis. What else can you want? It's a cocktail of crises. So how has agility supported resilience in this global supply chain? Thanks very much for the question. I think if we take a step back and, and 
just take a minute to sort of contemplate the scale of what we're seeing. So the health crisis is the most immediate and the most obvious. And the economic crisis is also fairly clear. But I, I was just reading, you know, I just was speaking with some of colleagues from the World Economic Forum who were talking about these World well, Bank and IMF research. basically says that this year is the first year since 1991 that we're going to see global poverty actually increase. So the number of people living in absolute poverty is going to increase for the first time in nearly three decades. So you know, the, the social ramifications as well as the economic ramifications of this crisis can't be understated. And when we think about from a supply chain perspective, what are we seeing? I mean, there have been a, a couple of different shifts, right? So in the beginning part of the year, it was really a capacity crisis. So people were still consuming, but what was happening was because of the widespread cancellation of passenger aircraft, there wasn't the capacity to move cargo around the world. But what's happened since then is not only has the capacity not covered, so we're still seeing you know, capacity levels that are 25% lower today than they were this time last year on, on air freight. So you have capacity that hasn't recovered, but you also have a demand crisis. So you have you know, what's effectively a recession occurring in, in 170 different countries simultaneously. And the first time in human, or the first time since World War II where you have both developed and developing countries and economic recession at the same time. Um, and the magnitude of what that means for food supply chains, health supply chains, um, you know, the, the movement of essential goods and the movement of everyday things that we just rely on, not, not just, you know, the, the obvious things like personal protective equipment, but also just, you know, the stuff that you want to be able to have access to, whether it's, you know, consumer goods uh, or, or, or even industrial goods has really been challenged. And in that context, and I think that's the context that agility is operating in, when we think about what we've been, what we focus on, it's really been on three things. So we have the internal piece, obviously, around health and safety and sort of protecting, you know, people. And, and that's not a small thing in a company where our people, um, certainly our operational teams, are, are frontliners. They continue to go to work every day. They're not working from home. They're working in a warehouse and they're, they're driving, you know, trucks and making deliveries. We have the commercial part of what we do, which is, you know, taking our core competence in logistics, helping arrange things like emergency air charters for governments around the world, working with our pharmaceutical um, customers to match them with demand with some of our government customers, for example, to move personal protective equipment where there were, you know, supply chain uh, bottlenecks for personal protective equipment. And then we have the pro bono piece of what we've been working on, which has very much been around working with local governments, helping them both with donations of logistic services, but also with expertise. So, for example, doing food security planning exercises um, with certain governments or working with, um, in the company's corporate head office in Kuwait, working with local NGOs to, and the local government authorities to ensure that food was provided to vulnerable migrant, fam migrant workers and families in, in lockdown areas of the country and so on. So that's been our, um, uh, our, our framework, if you like, for looking, for looking at this response. Thank you so much, Mariam, and uh, it's fascinating. Um, it, it's actually also very interesting to see how rapidly we are in a position to, to define this uh, new perception of reality and to be obviously following the right path. Because at the end of the day, it all started because of the security of the people. And, and now it, it it's evolved in, in, in and we just were just in a position to refocus all of our efforts into saving the mother earth because we are all aware that it needs to be saved at least from us and now we see we were put in a, in a tight agenda uh putting us on the very forefront of challenge and uh but still how important is the long-term investment in sustainability from your point of view, uh, given the, the current business and economic challenges that we're all facing? And um, do you think that everything that we have 
strict covenant as commitment will be abandoned for the sake of of creating this new normal. I think that this crisis is really, um, it's a, in every way a crisis that makes you think about sustainability really seriously and in the true meaning of the word. So sustainability on all dimensions. I think social rifts and growing inequality around the world is on display in a way that is very, very stark for, for everybody. And I think that there's no ignoring it. You know, I think there's no ignoring it. So I think that the human, the social dimension of sustainability, I think is, is, you know, that's certainly not going to be less important in the new normal. If you think about issues related to business continuity um, and the ability to be resilient as businesses, that's obviously critical in the new normal. And when I think about the environment and the sort of existential threat of climate change, I think it's not so existential, right? I think we have lived and are living through an abstract concept coming to life, a global pandemic, you know, and are seeing and feeling what kind of systemic disruption that, that you know, threat is causing. And I think what, what I find most interesting during this period of time is not just in agility, but across different industries, I'm not seeing a pullback from pre-COVID commitments, particularly around the environment. I'm actually seeing a lot of people stepping up and doubling down, right? And saying, no, actually, this is an area that we have to invest in even more going forward. Just like, you know, we didn't see this pandemic coming. We can't then be caught out by climate change and say, we didn't know it was coming. And so I actually think if I think about sort of from an agility perspective, we recently made a a sort of public announcement around some some of our sustainability investments in more sustainable road freight and green technologies um, that I'm very proud of. And I think it's a response to both the business requirements as well as the, the sort of the imperative to think about how we build back better. So I don't think I don't think topics of sustainability are going anywhere. Dr. Thank you so much, Mariam. And uh, I, I can't agree more. Um, at the end of the day, we are uh, supposed to make the right steps ahead in a very collaborative manner. Uh, we have recently accepted with pleasure the invitation of the World Economic Forum to join them as a strategic partner along with uh, WHO on um, their uplink COVID uh, uh, project and support them in um, bringing the, the innovation, the global innovation, you know, Webit is running the world's biggest uh, startup challenge with over 4,500 uh, startups applying. Tomorrow, there will be the pitching session um, as part of Corporate Sustainability Week. Uh, and um, we, we really see a global approach of uh, defining collaborative matters. And um, I'm very hopeful we'll see more and more uh, collaboration finding a way to creating the desirable future together. And uh, we are absolutely honored to have you here today with us. But well, we have one more special guest to join this discussion and further one more to help us hopefully moderate it further. Let me introduce my second guest in the studio. Robert Metzke is the Head of Sustainability and Chief of Staff Innovation and Strategy at Royal Philips. He is an experienced global program and team leader with passion for innovation, strategy, social impact and change leadership. In his double roles, Robert has been driving the company strategy towards innovative, sustainable business models and initiating and driving strategic initiatives across innovation, strategy, design and sustainability. Hello dear Robert, thank you for joining Webit Virtual. Thanks for having me, it's a great pleasure. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to have you with us. We are experiencing some uh, minor technological challenges. But uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's such a 
such a pleasure to keep you joining this virtual meeting with uh, so many great people from the Webit community. Yeah, I think so technical challenges. I will pick start up. immediately with a question for you. Sorry, Robert. Go ahead. I was saying technical challenges have been become part of everyday life now with everybody working from home and uh, getting used to Zoom. So I think uh, the audience is going familiar with it. Yes, indeed. So um, what is the role of sustainability within Philips? What is What are your focus areas? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, I, I would say sustainability is a core part of our strategy. It's really embedded in decision making at all levels at Philips. I mean, if we start at the highest level, then it's our mission as a leading health technology company to improve three billion people's lives, three billion people's lives by 2030, and to make the world more healthy and more sustainable through meaningful innovation. So, if that is your corporate mission, and you can imagine that a lot of things follow from that. Um, if you look at the areas that are really material to Philips, where we can make a difference. As health technology company, then on the social impact areas, we focus on health and well-being for all. That is SDG Sustainable Development Goal number three, uh, with providing access to healthcare. We have made a pledge here to bring healthcare to more than 300 million people in underserved communities in the next decade. And on the environmental side, we really focus on climate action. That's SDG number 13, and responsible use of materials um, and responsible production consumption. That's a circular economy. SDG number 12. Also on the environmental side, we really have said we want to not only operate carbon neutrally globally by the end of this year, but also we have science-based targets um, in line with the Paris Agreement. We are one of the top runners when it comes to circular economy. So really thinking about new ways of um, innovating uh, different business models, also not just recycling, but also refurbishment uh, using um, um, bio-based materials and so forth. So really creating value with wasting less materials. So in that sense, to your question, what's the role of sustainability within Philips? I think it's really embedded in everything that we do. And we have program axes, but it's a joint responsibility also with the business leaders um, and, and all employees, our 80,000 people around the globe. Thank you so much, Robert. Um, it's um it's one of these companies that actually is a symbol of innovation. We are all aware of what. Actually, I'm not sure if all the number of patents uh, Philips holds for things that we take like every day, but actually, this has been a result of creative work of a company that you are working for uh, for some time already. Uh, and so um, let's go particularly for what has changed within Philips during and uh, currently as part of the, the COVID-19 crisis. Yeah, thanks, uh, Plamen. Um, and maybe going back to also uh, what uh, Mariam already said, uh, um, we experienced the crisis as a huge catalyst of change. And also, it's a great mirror. Um, it, it shows, shows us, us that, that many, many of the problems that we try to solve are interconnected. It's not just about the environment. It's not just about access to healthcare. These things are interdependent. Uh, so um, what has changed? I think the crisis is a great way to reflect upon that and innovate beyond technology. It's also innovating when it comes to interacting with the customers, interacting uh, within the teams, reflecting on personal development as leaders. Um, so maybe answering your questions at three different levels. What is changing in the company? What is changing at the industry level? And what's changing at the economy level? And I'll keep it thought short, <laughs> the short amount of time that we have together. I think at the company level, you see a different way of working, how people engage with each other, much more focused purpose. -driven. Maybe to just give you uh, one little example, we have been able to uh, develop a um, respirator um, um, device that helps people with uh, COVID disease in hospital settings that has been developed within a, a matter of weeks and got approval from the authorities within a matter of uh, 48 hours that has been unprecedented. So I think creating focus um, in, the, um, in the face of a crisis and 
teaming up to complex supply chains end to end around the globe with uh, four different innovation hubs from Shanghai to Bangalore to, um, um, to the United States to the Netherlands um, and, people and teams working on it around the globe 24 hours, um, seven days a week and really push things through because they know it matters to people. That is really inspiring to see. And I would hope that we could, we can uh, save some of that uh, and embed it in our everyday work to become more agile um, and really focused and, and, and purpose -driven. very inspiring. Maybe at the industry level, uh, COVID is really pushing digitalization. I mean, in the healthcare industry, you can imagine uh, what, uh, what is happening. Uh, things that we have been saying on our strategy papers since a decade now, like you need to get people out of the hospitals to lower cost care settings. You need to, meet, to move to outcome-based uh, uh, care. You need to help people live healthier lives so that they are more resilient. And then first time round, right diagnosis, uh, minimally invasive treatment if possible. Uh, getting people out of these high-risk uh, intensive care units uh, if they don't necessarily need it. All that has been worked on, on paper and with great technological innovation, but to get it into a workflow of a hospital and in health systems, that has been greatly accelerated through the impact of COVID. Um, and we are not at the, end, at, the end, at the end of that yet. So I would argue that um, the healthcare systems globally are really transforming under the impact of COVID. Um, maybe the last level, what's happening on the social, societal level, um, economy level. As I said, these topics are interconnected and our CEO just signed last week a statement also that really urges to focus the um, rebuilding efforts of the different governments around the globe also around a greener, um, a more social, more inclusive uh, and more sustainable economy. So I think also here we see an increasing understanding that we are living in an interdependent society with interdependent problems and we cannot solve them in isolation. So we need to tie it together and really use the chance that we have now to, uh, to step up um, and um, find better solutions that uh, serve all stakeholders. We're all looking forward for such solutions. I would like to remind uh, our uh, community that uh, you can ask your questions through all our channels with hashtag WebEd. And uh, of course, we will try to answer some of them um, through during this uh, particular virtual event. Ask your questions with hashtag WebEd over LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, of course, the channels that you have through, through our platform. Uh, Robert, uh, I would like to bring now to the studio both of you with uh, Mariam and um, to make a step back because we already uh, built the bridge between the pre and uh, the current state of, uh, of COVID uh, crisis that we are going through. But let's remind everyone that it all started uh, in an effort of uh, finding a solution for saving people's lives uh, and putting people's life as more important than economy, which is a wonderful uh, way of state the development of the community that uh, we live in and the society. Corporate responsibility, which used to be um, connected predominantly to creating sustainable and uh, resilient development solutions, would need now to adapt also to the new ways of creating a secure, sustainable, resilient environment for uh, the employees. So how do you perceive the change in the corporate strategies uh, in that particular manner? Marian, maybe first to you, and then we have Robert, and please feel free to to jump into the discussion, both of you. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I think, uh, Dr. Rousseff, this is an issue that's sort of near and dear to our hearts, because, as I said, you know, logistics is an essential service, and most of our people are are in the front lines. So we're not, let's say, a professional services firm that has the luxury of being able to have all of our people work fully digitally or remotely. So these questions of how we work are, are huge. Um, and I would say there are a couple of different dimensions to it. The first is, I think when it comes to 
the operational teams. That's for us a sort of top of mind top topic. How do you ensure that people that are working in the warehouses to move goods, that are driving trucks around, are safe and protected as they do a job that is both difficult and that is potentially, you know, higher risk. And I think we we've spent a lot of time developing a lot of protocols around what that looks like. And um, and you know, you know, it, it impacts every aspect of sort of the workforce, right? So how how you yeah how you think about shift. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of work that goes into that on the on the HSE side. I think when it comes to our office space employees, you know, 80% of whom are still working remotely around the world because in many in many countries the lockdowns haven't yet fully lifted or are only partially lifted. I think you know this acceleration of digital, both at the company level and the industry level, as Robert mentioned, is very real and it's happening in all industries. It's not just happening in the health industry, and it's requiring a real rethink of our operating models around how business is done and what you know what stays you know and what gets done where. So I, I think there is a sort of profound reexamination of business in terms of health and safety, yes, but also beyond health and safety um, because of this, this COVID-19. And I don't think it's going anywhere. I don't think these are short. I mean, I'll just give you one tiny example. So we, um, we do human rights audits for uh, all of our operations and we have a sort of publicly stated goal that says that all of our emerging market operations will be audited by third parties. And um, one of the things that we've been looking at is, is let's say, accommodation standards for, for workforce in parts of the world where we house, house employees. And, you know, maybe six months ago, it was good enough to be, you know, the ILO standard or a little bit better than the ILO standard. Well, today there are new standards. There are the COVID-19 standards, you know, that need to be implemented. And, you know, how we think about, you know, everything, physical space, worker accommodations, physical spaces, are that are changing, and there's no going back. Sorry, a long answer to a short question, but... Uh, I mean, well, there is no one answer to this question. I'm not asking for a particular, because, you know, we, the uncertainty is what is uh, guiding us in this uh, strange times. Uh, Rowan, what is your take on this? Now, I recognize many things that uh, Mariam has managed. Um, so from our perspective as a uh, health technology company, we have formulated a triple duty of care, uh, where we really focus um, in first instance, of course, also on the health and safety of our uh, nearly 80,000 employees who are really working often in the frontline order, supporting the customers in hospital settings. Uh, but um, um, of course, also the duty towards the customer, serving our customers, even in the most critically affected areas. So really taking input from also external advisors like WHO, the CDC, and so forth to understand where is the impact. Uh, how do you prioritize uh, deployment of scarce uh, material? Um, and so customers, the employees, but of course also the, the duty of care towards our businesses. So if you say, business like Philips is critical to help address and manage such a crisis, you also need to make sure that um, your business uh, survives such a crisis. So thinking about business continuity, uh, strengthening the supply chains, uh, working together with your customers, your suppliers, um, and reprioritizing, I think that was what Mariam also was saying, it's really forcing you to rethink what you are doing why you're doing it, being cautiously or being very consciously aware of why you're doing it, how you're doing it, where you're doing that, right? And stitching it together in, in, this, uh, uh, in this crisis. So in that sense, a very profound uh, moment to, to reflect. Many of uh, the events. Something that Robert said, it's something that Robert said, may I, is it okay? Yeah. I would just say Sorry, that- Sorry, please go ahead. Yeah. Those things that Robert said really resonate with me and I just wanna just, just um, call them out. One is the fact that I do think that you're going to see new partnerships forming uh, on all levels because of this COVID-19 crisis. It's not just sort of 
the issues around more diversification related to your supply chains and your, your suppliers, I think you're going to see real partnerships around innovation and use of information to close some of the gaps that Robert talked about. So to close some of the gaps around in, you know, maybe for the healthcare industry, it's, it's positioning, you know, equipment and supplies and uh, for, for, let's say for, for the logistics industry, you know, I see us working with competitors under the auspices of the World Economic Forum to do things like supply chain disruption modeling, understanding because, you know, if you take a whole bunch of these companies, a lot of data between us around, you know, being able to sort of see where the threats come, where the early warnings for certain threats are, and to be able to do some of this supply chain matching that Robert was talking about. And so I think you're going to see a lot of that, both partnerships and the sharing of data, not in a way that sort of reaches any commercial um, or competitive sensitivities, but in ways that actually end up being potentially, you know, life-saving life life and game-changing. Definitely, data will play its uh, special role in uh, our post-COVID, whatever it is, new normal. Uh, it is playing currently. What I was uh, trying to, to define, but um, I understand that it's not an easy question, I'm not pushing for an answer, is particularly what, I mean, we've seen in the 80s how people are working in cubics. We see a lot of these researches where people say, I'm not going back to work. I want to spend more time with my family. I want to be more with my children. I want to be this, I want to be that. So it's, a, it's not exactly the same um, trend which we have seen pre-COVID. I was traveling 200 days per year until January this year, January, February. And uh, I'm sure you are traveling a lot, both of you. Uh, so that's where I wanted to understand your vision on the corporate um, uh, strategy when it comes to creating new working environment and, uh, and building up on it. But let's, let's move to, to uh, the questions which are, um, I would say, not easier to answer but are more aligned with the topics today. And uh, uh, Robert, you are a, a major healthcare company. Uh, where does your role lie within, within the, when it comes to climate and sustainability? Yeah, thanks. Um, I would anchor that answer in the what I said previously, right? So I see sustainability not as a Friday afternoon activity, but it's really embedded in what we do. And that's also how it should be, I believe. Uh, there's an intrinsic link, of course, also between climate change and healthcare. Uh, the World Health Organization, WHO, has called the Paris Climate Treaty possibly the most important healthcare treaty of the 21st century. And being fully aware of the enormous impact of climate change on creating additional burdens uh, for healthcare systems, spreading of communicable diseases, um, 100,000 additional deaths every year because of heat waves uh, that uh, really hit the most fragile groups uh, in society also. So there's an intrinsic uh, link. At the same time, we know that the healthcare industry end-to-end -end emits more CO2 than all airlines together on the globe, which is absurd if you think about it, right? Every doctor takes the oath of Hippocrates um, to do no harm, but there seems to be some kind of disconnect between uh, trying to focus on saving patients' lives and at the same time having to work with means and an environment that is so disruptive and destructive to the planet that we need as a living, as a base for healthy living and for our societies, that you need to reconcile it. Now we see that uh, many thousands of hospitals have pledged to become carbon neutral also, uh, Care providers become more aware of that. They uh, often develop a very holistic perspective on what sustainable healthcare looks like, going beyond climate impact, but also thinking about waste management, about circular models, uh, material management, uh, but also community um, engagement. So that's very encouraging to see. Now, what do we do within uh, Philips and what's the role of a sustainability, head of sustainability then globally? I it starts with 
um, translating them into a climate change or climate action strategy, developing policies around it, setting the KPIs, but really driving a, ma a major, I would say, transformation effort, including having a clear narrative that everybody can relate to, investing into the right capabilities, understanding what the economic consequences are, and then making sure that this lands not just in the operations. Huh? So as I said, uh, by the end of this year, we want to be operating carbon neutrally globally in cooperation with our um, also uh, logistics providers, by the way, Mariam, but also really factoring that in, into our innovation and technology roadmaps, because a big part of the impact that we have globally is in the energy usage of the products once they are on the market. So we have science-based targets uh, in line with the Paris Treaty, which means that we are committed for the next decades to really continue to push energy efficiency of our entire equipment. And that is a major effort across all business units. And that really goes deep into strategy and innovation. Thank you so much, Robert. And um, if we, if we uh, need to wrap up, I think that uh, I would say that um, that type of approach will make definitely a difference. Uh, the, question is, uh, the question is, are all corporates really taking it that seriously and uh, are so um, responsibly um, biased when it comes to finding the solution? Let me invite here one more um, person who is uh, having a take on this, but also will be my co-host. Let me introduce him to you. John Aidan Byrne is an award-winning journalist at the New York Post and podcast host of Life on Planet Earth. He is a media consultant, co-editor on the Zicklin School of Business Financial Markets series books and a Broadway alumnus. His work is published also in Wall Street Journal, National Catholic Register, Institutional Investor, and other outlets. Hi, John. Thank you for joining us. How are you? Oh, it's a terrific pleasure being among distinguished company. Uh, the world has certainly changed. We're all on this virtual meeting, and it's, it's superb. I'm learning so much, and I have some interesting questions to ask today, I hope. We're also learning from your blog, and um, thank you so much for joining. Indeed, the company is fantastic. I'm also truly honored to have such a wonderful panel. Uh, I would like now to give the lead to you. That is it for you. See, we're talking about responsibility, but I'm <laughs> turning the responsibility to your hands. So let's uh, with you now in my team and uh, to see how this discussion could be shaped through your eyes. Well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Robert and Marion, you covered a lot of issues there. Um, talked about sustainability, uh, digital digitalization, um, business continuity, and a whole host of issues. The world has clearly changed. I'd like to just focus on sustainability and innovation in terms of uh, climate change, uh, the ending of world poverty by ethical means, um, green technologies and so on. Both your enterprises are large scale global operators. You have a footprint throughout the world. Uh, you're not small enterprises by any means. So you can leverage uh, economies of scale. Um, in, in light of what we're seeing in COVID-19 and the way the world has shut down, there's, we're looking at forecasts of 5% decline in, in global growth. And that might be a conservative estimate um, that came out of, from the World Bank. But in terms of smaller scale enterprises, um, how are they going to get through this COVID-19 intact? Many businesses are basically going to be gone this and can mutual cooperation between the larger and the smaller ones maybe shore up some of these smaller enterprises and do you think we're going to see a lot of acquisitions afterwards so i can um 
jump in there if, if you don't mind. I mean, I think one of the most worrying trends is you know the fate of small and medium enterprises, right? If you if you really think about it, I mean SMEs account for thirds of all of the jobs around the world. Um, and they're, you know, they're the bulk of what keeps certainly in emerging markets, you know, they, they, they're the employment engines. And there's no question that they've been heavily around the world and across, across sectors heavily impacted by, by this crisis. And I think about from an agility perspective, we have a whole SME enablement sort of um, strategy as part of our, as part of our um, whole moving online digital, e supporting cross-border e-commerce. And so for us, like we, we agree with you that A, it's very worrying, but B, that there really is a role to play. That there's, you know, there are new opportunities. A lot of them are around the digital opportunity and there are opportunities not only with large companies, but also with, new technologies that create opportunities, including economic opportunities for SMEs that didn't exist even a decade ago, right? And I, I'll just take one second around the e-commerce. So if you look at some of the WTO stats on, on, um, on SMEs that export, only 30% of SMEs around the world currently export. But if you look at the same SMEs that have internet capabilities and a digital footprint, the export numbers go up to 80 to 90%. So, you know, this whole acceleration of digital might be the, the answer and the way forward for, for SMEs. So that, I'll leave it at that. Robert? If I can build on that, uh, Mariam, I think it's important to indeed uh, uh, be aware of the fact that the bulk of the global economies is in SMEs and family-owned companies, right? There are a couple of big multinationals, of course, with well-known brands. Um, they are not the bulk of the economy, but they um, have a role to play, and they can do that also, and we can do that also as Philips. If you think about, for instance, our global supply chains, you already referred to, to human rights uh, assessment and the labor conditions. Uh, we have between 10 and 50,000 suppliers, depending on how you count them. Uh, working with them on transparency, on standards, on capability building, um, being very clear about what we aspire um, and where we are, where they can find us to partner up with, I think is a huge impact also under these um, challenging times, let's say under COVID or so. I think uh, being a member of the family, so to say, in one of these branches of, um, of the corporate supply chain um, can also be a little bit of an umbrella in stormy weather. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, one of the things that we find really interesting, we track um, we track who asks us about sustainability, right? So, Robert, you said, you know, you're going to be asking your logistics service providers to, to help you meet those goals. And we get that a lot from a lot of different customers. And over the years, what's been so interesting is that you've seen a shift it's not only the global brands, the multinationals, you know, the people with 10,000 employees and more that are asking you these questions. You're beginning to see suppliers, you know, further down the supply chain or customers further down the supply chain, smaller and smaller businesses around the world, not just in Western economies, but in emerging economies as well, beginning to ask these same questions. And I think that's such an encouraging sign. I mean, that sort of, that, that sentiment analysis, if you like, is one of the things that we look at that drives the behavior and the change within the business because it's about you know understanding the market and what the market wants right? uh, and the underlying movement maybe yeah, um, is also the reconsideration of purpose and the business of business and we know that uh, since uh, henry ford and peter drucker and what have you not uh, <laughs> seems that the question has been on the table many times over um, even the american business council has signed something last year about uh, the role of business in society. I think uh, in Europe, uh, we have the Rhineland model uh, participation and there are different ways to think about what the role of business in society is. Uh, but I think it has become clearer to all stakeholders around the table, including the employees, the customers, but also the investors, that uh, everybody wants and needs a role of business in society that goes beyond uh, maximizing shareholder value. 
fascinating. And they're not contradictory, you know. Maximizing shareholder value does not mean, does not come at it. I mean, you can maximize shareholder value and be sustainable. The two are not necessarily in opposite. And technology, and technology is driving that, that gap closing, right? Uh, Marian, I, could I pick up on something Marian said? Um, the small enterprises who have a digital uh, infrastructure and backbone are better positioned. That raises the question of uh, strong digital platforms in developing nations. I'm wondering, are we going to see some kind of a shakeout after we come out of this COVID-19 disaster in developing nations? They already have systemic problems. Are they going to grow worse because they don't have, you know, high speed networks and proper infrastructure? Any sense on that? Well, I think if you look at sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, I have a I have a strong sense on that. I think that actually there is a lot of focus from emerging markets across the board on building digital infrastructure because everybody knows that it's a way to leapfrog. And, um, and I think what's been really interesting, if you look at sort of government stimulus packages in parts of Southeast Asia, for example, and I live in Singapore, so... So, you know, this is sort of top of mind is government stimulus packages to support people that have been out of work have been linked to digital skill building. So while people are on furlough, they also have the opportunity to sort of retrain and rethink. And that's been, you know, that's been across the board, this digital agenda in countries like Indonesia, not just Singapore, but Indonesia and Malaysia, Cambodia and so on. Um, and I think that there is this, this appetite and desire. And if you look at e-commerce and sort of cross-border e-commerce, Whereas the growth, the growth, the it's the fastest growing segment of international trade, and the growth is coming largely from emerging markets. So, the, for example, the Middle East is the world's fastest, is the fastest growing e-commerce market in the world, and obviously China holds seventy percent of the global e-commerce. China, U.S., and Germany between them hold seventy percent of the of the global e-commerce market. But China is, you know, a major player, and along with China comes, you know, slowly, slowly the rest of Asia. So, I don't think emerging markets are necessarily at a tremendous disadvantage. I think it's the opposite. I think you're going to really see the opportunity to trade and participate increase exponentially. And I know yeah. that we, for example, at Agility, you know, we've built a, a platform for SMEs to trade, to do the, the e-commerce logistics side with exactly that in mind, because we see that there's an opportunity there. We didn't build it for, you know, it's, it's a core commercial product. But um, we built it because we see the market opportunity and we see that this is an area of growth. I would violently agree, Mariam. It's a little bit boring maybe, but uh, I think you mentioned <laughs> that could resonate. Uh, a, there is the entire movement around building back better, building back better, right? So using it, um, uh, and that goes, I think, around the globe. Secondly, um, there are concepts like tech debt. And um, so leapfrogging is a real chance for uh, countries and markets that are not so heavily invested into all the uh, fragmented and legacy systems. Um, and there are some really nice examples. Uh, you sure. mentioned the world, uh, so I'm also one of the members of the Global Futures Council. We are thinking about how to uh, bring that to life. From the Philips side, we have uh, set up a um, digital connected care coalition where we try to bring the different tech players together to talk about how to enable access to healthcare in emerging countries, for instance. Um, and such a platform really gets to life very quickly in, the, in times of crisis, because then you have specific questions and asks that you want to solve. For instance, in Kenya and Africa, where you bring different partners together and new ideas emerge. Um, so I think, yes, there is a digital divide, um, but there are also huge opportunities uh, to get organized around it and build vital infrastructure and especially digital infrastructure and not uh, investing in maybe leapfrogging mistakes that have been made um, in different parts of the world. Very good. I, I have a follow. I have another question, Dr. Rusoff, if you want me to ask here. Of course, um, please. Yes, okay. Um, I just go back a little in history and time. We had the 2007-2008 financial crisis. Then we had the dot-com bust. 
And wondering if there are any lessons or parallels we can draw from those experiences where there was a major shakeout in global commerce that can be applied today. And what might those lessons be? Lessons of survival, lessons of sustainability. Maybe shall I take a first shot at that, uh, Marianne? Um, my two cents would be, um, as with any crisis, you're challenging the status quo. Uh, so in that sense, um, companies, business models, and industries that are at the verge of being extinct may just get the final push, so to say. Um, that drives shakeout. And I would, um, I would say uh, we see that. That seems to be to some part inevitable, but it also means that you need to think about what does that do to livelihoods, to infrastructures, to cities and townships that are depending on these types of industries and infrastructures. Um, and how do you then indeed enable communities to shift to uh, new models, more future-proof models? And what is the responsibility of governments and other players uh, to enable the transition? I think that are important questions to ask and maybe also to reflect upon in the light of, of earlier crises that we have seen. Yes. Maria? Mar do you want to come in here? Yeah, I would say a couple of things. I would, I would say, you know, the global financial crisis was a massive, you know, transition and economic crisis and you know, change environment for many companies. But it wasn't just the global financial crisis. If you think about sort of the, the pace of digitization pre-COVID, you know, and the implications and the change, the change environment that that created for businesses. Uh, COVID-19, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, you know, the scale, the depth, the complexity, the, you know, the, the range of issues that COVID-19 has raised is, you know, multidimensional in a way that maybe we haven't seen before, but it all plays to themes we have seen before and that we've been dealing with not just 10 years ago, but that we've been dealing with within our businesses regularly and more often. And I think that, you know, crisis also creates opportunities. And I think, you know, if you look at the lessons of the global financial crisis and digitization and sort of the fourth industrial revolu revolution, if you like, you see that, you know, a lot of new businesses were born and a lot of new business ideas were born, a lot of different ways of thinking about what the role of businesses is, you know, the ability to scale up, scale down quickly, more flexible workforces, the sort of the rise of that whole, you know, uh, part-time or, you know, freelance workforce, all of that has been a function of the last 10 years or so. And so I think, you know, there is a lot to draw on um, and it's not so, it doesn't come, this crisis doesn't come out of left field. It's an acceleration of existing themes. Right, and that is an opportunity. That's an opportunity, as well, for change. Maybe a thought I would like to add, uh, if I may. Um, what you also see, um, and it came up in the earlier, that you need to approach for solutions in a systemic way. So systems thinking. Um, that is important. That also means that you need to find ways to bring different stakeholders to the table and to come to integrated decisions. To give you an example, uh, if you would only optimize for uh, economic interest, then you would maybe reopen um, prematurely uh, and cause many different uh, um, problems, right? Um, if you only optimize for the safety and security of the and you damage uh, economies here, um, and sacrifice the long -term livelihood of entire communities. So you need to have different perspectives and bring them together. So dialogue is very important and systems thinking is very important. And that's something that came also to, to life in earlier crisis. You cannot solve the debt crisis uh, in, in the south of Europe without looking into other elements, right? And including socioeconomic dimensions and so forth. So having a more systemic approach and a long-term perspective is important to get out of it and that again requires uh, leadership and it requires trust uh, and it goes 
far beyond management and short term positions gaining the next or whatever. Making the next quarter. Well, thank you. Yeah, I would like to, to say that unfortunately the time is pressing us. And I feel like there is so much more to be said. And obviously much more to be done. But as Robert um, mentioned, it is time when the leadership is the most needed. It is the time of darkness when the light is showing the way. And so I'm very grateful to the destiny, to my team, to the fact that what we do is uh, exactly this, to bring leaders together and to challenge the opportunities because let's not take it as a pressing question. Let's take it as a great opportunity for us to build this better world sooner than we even thought of. I think that's the time of, and uh, this great leadership talk we had today is a wonderful proof of how agile the organizations are, large organizations like Philips, like Agility, like all of these big corporates that we work with find very quickly their way. And uh, this is, I think, the right way ahead. I'm very grateful for all of you for being with us, John. Thanks for taking my role for the first part of, uh, of this uh, particular virtual event and uh, supporting us in extracting as much uh, value for the Webit wonderful community as possible. I would like to make a small announcement now at the end of this event. We are just at the beginning of the Corporate Responsibility Week. Tomorrow, we shall be meeting you with uh, uh, four investors and uh, three amazing companies, three fantastic startups, Bloom, Ecotree, and uh, Solitaire Power. They're doing some phenomenal work. You'd better be with us and see what they're doing and see who's going to be the winner. We've selected those out of uh, several hundred in the area of corporate responsibility. So you can bet you'll hear some fantastic presentation and at the same time, reflection from really top-notch investors. And on Thursday, we shall be meeting you with uh, the leading media forum with Nina, who is a uh, creative diversity lead and journalist from BBC, with Red Power, you have seen him a uh, couple of weeks ago at Webit. He's a uh, columnist and best-selling author, uh, part of Inc. magazine and Forbes, and uh, Tarmo Vikri from uh, Reuters. They will reflect on the whole week and they will share their thoughts on where are and what are the directions they see the corporate responsibility developing. My special gratitude to uh, my great uh, guests here today. Thank you again, Marian, Robert, and uh, John. And I will see all of you wonderful Webit community exactly in 22 hours, 59 minutes, and 40 seconds. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye. This program is powered by the virtual.show, making your offline events virtual.